What's going on all you mentees? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition and join me today for an advanced look at some trade paperbacks coming out from Marvel this week. So let's get started. Before going any further, a huge shout out to David Gabriel and the folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these trade paperbacks, masterworks, graphic novels, and a poster book. So all these books are due out in the direct market on February 3rd. However, it really depends on where you get your books. Sometimes they're a little bit earlier. Uh, sometimes they're literally on Wednesday, if that's at your local comic book shop. And a couple of weeks later in the book market. So we got a lot to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started. The first one we're going to be looking at is that Eternals poster book. So the first one we're going to do is a size comparison to show you just how big these poster books are. Here's a standard size trade paperback. We'll be looking at this in a little while, but this is what we're going to be focusing on. So let's go ahead and get this opened. The Eternals poster book. It seems like we're getting so much Eternals material lately, mainly because of the movie that was supposed to be out already. And so it looks like we have some covers, uh, some of the house ads, recolored covers, and I wonder if they have the Cersei one that I've always loved. Yes, that one is so gorgeous. Okay. So on the back is nothing, so you can just pull these out. And it is perforated, so these are easily to pull out. And the poster, I mean, it is poster paper, so it is thick. It has a flat mat on the surface, and then on the back it's glossy. But you can see artwork here from John Romita Jr., Jack Kirby, Lionel Francis Yu, Oliver Coipel, Daniel Acuna. We'll be looking at that arc here in a little bit. And just some more. Man, Romita Jr., he really killed it on that series with Neil Gaiman. There's my boy, the Black Swordsman, who will also be appearing in the movie. Because he does have ties to the Eternals. Now, I'm not going to show all of them, but let's look here in the back. This is uh, from the Marvel Pop Art Productions. The book retails for $24.99. So it features all these characters from the Eternals. And the actual book, the way that it's contained, it does have, it's like a really thick, hard board. It's not a hard cover. And here's what the spine looks like. Not sure who keeps the posters in the spine or who takes them all out. Actually, I'd love to know that. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you keep the poster books like this? Put them in a shelf or under the bed somewhere? Or do you pull out all the posters? I forgot about that Todd Knock cover. Yeah, that one's awesome. Next up is the Disney Kingdom's Figment. This is a graphic novel size book. So meaning that this is a smaller scale to the traditional trade paperbacks. And we'll be looking at all the spines together here shortly. Uh, the book retails for $15.99 and collects Figment, the miniseries, the five issue miniseries from 2014, and then the follow up series from 2015. I remember this cover, and this was released as a hardcover format. Now, first of all, when I was looking at the solicitations for February, I really thought that was Lockheed, but apparently it's a character known as Figment. I must not be up to par with my knowledge of Disney parks. So it's an Epcot character, I believe, is what somebody told me, or Magic Kingdom. Whoever it was that told me and corrected me in the comments, please let me know. Is it Magic Kingdom or is it Epcot? Regardless, it's a magical little creature, but they throw in some steampunk elements in here. What I will say about this is... Man, I'm kind of upset that I didn't read this uh, when it was available in hardcover or when it was available in trade paperback because the artwork is freaking phenomenal. So let me show you the talents that are in here. So first of all, uh, this is all written by Jim Zub, and he's the gentleman that took over uh, Conan. He's written Avengers. Uh, but the penciler is Felipe Andrade and then Ramon Bach in the, for Figment number two. But look at the inkers. You have Howard Chaikin, Steve Leahoha, Rick Hoberg and Bill Ray. So you have a lot of talent that went into this graphic novel. And while I've not read it, I was looking at the artwork. So they throw in steampunk elements in here. And I really don't think that's part of the Magic Kingdom or Epcot Center. I think they just threw in magic and steampunk to make it a better storyline. So it is not Lockheed. But just looking at the arc, it looks freaking awesome. Um, the book, by the way, has... 272 pages 
And here's the second series of Figment. So the artwork here by Ramon Box is a little bit different. It's a little cleaner, if you will. Whereas the first series is a little sketchier, a little more detailed. And uh, let's look at, actually, let's look at the, uh, that's cute. Uh, maybe my daughter will like this. Maybe I'll have her review it. Let's look in the back here. She did love Ant-Man, or I'm sorry, the Unstoppable Wasp. There seems to be a, all this stuff back here. All these pa uh, pages are extras. Ah, I probably should have read back here first. The Figment of Imagination explaining where all these ideas came from. And original artwork from the park and literature. That's pretty cool. Aha, Figment and the Dreamfinder character study. Dude, I've been to Disney World like twice. How did I not know this was a thing? Did I not ride this? Is it a ride? Whoa, that is really cool. So this is interior pages. Inter. Uncanny Omar Talk Pretty One Day. Interior pages. And then Journey. This is the stuff from uh, the extras from the second volume from Figment 2. That artwork is awesome. And I really love Jim Sub. You know, these... Uh, Disney Kingdom books really surprised me. Like, the Haunted one was really good. Just can't keep a good zombie down. Marvel Zombies Resurrection. This book retails for $19.99 and collects the Marvel Zombies Resurrection one-shot and the Marvel Zombies five-issue miniseries or Marvel Zombies Resurrection miniseries. Here are the credits. You have Philip Kennedy Johnson uh, writing it and then you have Leonard Kirk. Leonard Kirk is uh, an artist that has just worked about everything. Lately, he's done a lot of Star Wars, though. But this is pretty much the story of the corpse of Galactus just floating up in a space, and then it's up to the X-Men, the Avengers, and the Fantastic Four to go and investigate. What is going on? Why is it dead? And then, of course, by happenstance, they all start getting infected and turning into these zombies, if you will. So, this does take place in an alternate uh, timeline, so it, it's not canon, it's not part of the 616 universe, and because a lot of characters die, a lot of characters get turned into zombies, so just keep that in mind, and just much like the original Marvel Zombies comics that they took place in a different universe. Now, one of the things you may have noticed when I flipped here to the back is the parental advisory, uh, and that is mainly due to the violence, because they're... I mean, when you're dealing with zombies, there's only sometimes one way to take them down, and that's by chopping the head off. And even that sometimes doesn't take them down. But I did want to showcase some of this artwork, and we'll look in the back here in a second for the extras. So it's up to people like Spider-Man, because the, the really cool thing about this story, and this was a pretty quick read, is that all the main heroes at the very beginning, all the X-Men, or most of the X-Men, most of the Fantastic Four, and most of the Avengers, all get turned into zombies. So now Galactus comes to Earth, and it's up to the and there's this really cool sequence right here in the first issue, yeah, right here where the corpse uh, comes down and then all the infected characters start attacking the citizens of Earth. So it's up to Spider-Man and then characters like my boy Blade, Franklin Richards, uh, to team up and take down all these characters and to try to find a cure. So this things like that, cool. Uh, let's look in the back here for extras. So we do have variant covers and they're all splash pages of the variant covers. I've always been a big fan of the stupid zombie variants. Don't make fun of me. I love when they take a classic cover. What was it? Arthur Sudium that did the, the original ones. I don't care what classic cover it was. I always got a kick out of what variation he did with the zombie version of it. But it doesn't look like we have any Arthur Sudium in this. We just have Greg Land and Lionel Francis Yu and Philip Tan. That's an awesome name or. So... Let's keep going. So now we're looking at the Eternals to defy the apocalypse and This is a follow-up to the Neil Gaiman uh, series. So when Neil Gaiman came back and revamped the characters uh, Marvel decided to continue the Eternals and they gave it to two wonderful amazing writers and that is right up there Charlie Charles <laughs> Charles and Daniel Knopf and what I will say about them is that immediately when they took over Iron Man, they, they're the ones that did the, um, what is it, the Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. storyline after Civil War, I was so stoked to have them writing comics because I was familiar with their work on television. Uh, they did a sadly canceled series on HBO called Carnival, 
And I love that series. It ended on a cliffhanger after season two, but it didn't get picked up. It was supposed to be six seasons, and they had this whole story arc uh, planned. However, much like anything else that is great, it got canceled long before its time. Uh, so when they came over and took over Iron Man, that run was awesome if you've not read it. Uh, and then they took over Eternals. And I was really excited to see them take over this book. And they were teamed up with this artist known as Daniel Acuna. Now, Daniel Acuna has done work uh, for DC and Marvel. He had a run on, um, what is it, uh, oh, uh, Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters. He had a run on Flash. Um, it's probably what he's probably known most for is his uh, run on Flash. But then he started working on uh, Marvel Comics. And his artwork is very unique. He has a painted style look to his art. And it doesn't fit every character, but this fit the tone of the story, I always thought. So it's the return of the Eternals after the events that happened in Neil Gaiman's run. And now they're at odds with each other because we have the uh, the Dreaming Celestial coming back. It's landed in, as you could see here in San Francisco. Yeah, right here, this image is so freaking creepy and awesome. See what I mean by Daniel Acuna's artwork fitting the storyline? And that's what puts the Eternals at odds. So you have the return of Icarus and Makati and uh, Cersei, Thena. All those characters are back. Fostos comes back. And they're all at odds with each other as to how to handle the return of a Celestial. And then later on, this is pretty interesting. I don't know what happened um, towards the end of the book. After the annual, there is a team up with the X-Men. And it was all part, yeah, starting right around this issue. It's all part of the Manifest Destiny era of X-Men. So maybe they were trying to loop in the Eternals. Because the Eternals have always had a hard time just fitting in somewhere in the Marvel Universe. Because that's what Jack Kirby intended. Jack Kirby intended them to be their own little pocket universe. But, you know, eventually they showed up in the pages of Thor and Iron Man and... Now they're all over the place in the Marvel Universe. So I think they were trying to fit them into the X-Men Universe during this time. And back here, the artwork is mainly supplied by Eric Wynn and Sarah Pichelli. Someone told me that's how you pronounce her last name. And then you have the annual. And the annual, actually the annual does take place after the Manifest Destiny storyline. This is written by Fred Van Lente, another underrated uh, writer. And there's my girl Cersei. But let's look in the back. I don't think they have any extras. Okay. Uh, so this is part of the Spectacular Spider-Man Annual Number 8. This is a just a feature that was um, in the back. And it was reprinted in the Eternals Annual Number 1. So they kept it back here. This is written by, I think, Jerry Conway. And, of course, the artwork definitely is Mark Bagley. And that's pretty much all the extras they have. Uh, the book retails for $24.99 and has 256 pages. They weren't doing a lot of variants back then, so that's probably, I say that and there's a variant, damn it. I love being proven wrong, but I guess the variants are on the opposite uh, page of the standard edition cover, or the regular cover, rather. My pick of the week, Scarlet Witch, the complete collection. And we have a lot of books coming out this week. Uh, not just these, but we also have three oversized hardcovers that I've already uh, talked about. Uh, I've done videos on the channel for one of them is the Jason Aaron Conan oversized hardcover Venom volume two by Donny Cates and then the X-Men disassembled. But I know I'm excited about a lot of those, those other books, but this is the book that I don't want anybody to miss out on. This is Scarlet Witch, the complete collection. This is from the 2016 series, all 15 issues of that series and the material from Dr. Strange, the last days of magic are collected in here. And why do I push this series? Some of you have been asking me when I started talking about how great and underrated the series is. Wanda has been a character that's been around for a long time in the Marvel Universe. But she's never really had her own story arc. Now, in the times that they do make the own, her own story arc shine, or usually she has ties to another character. She's always playing the side character. And then even, even when she shines, it's always because she's crazy or she's losing her mind. So this is sort of a redemption story arc. So magic, or rather witchcraft, has gone kind of crazy in the 616 universe. And it's up to Wanda to restore it along with... This is a little bit of a spoiler, but I don't... I think by now most people know with Agatha Harkness. And Agatha's a ghost. I'll let you find out how she got here. Those are... Actually, all of it is explained in here, how it all happened. 
And this is her redemption story arc. We're introduced to a new foe, and she's going on location. She's going on a world tour. She's going to Paris. She's going to Italy. Uh, she's going to Gre the Greek Isles, to Ireland. So, trying to restore witchcraft and magic. And along the way, you know, she finds a lot about herself. Why she uh, is the way she is. And the cool thing about this is that each issue is drawn by a different artist. For the most part. Uh, sometimes the artist draws two issues. There's some beautiful artwork in here. As a matter of fact, I think I said this earlier. Uh, we have Steve Dillon. I think, I want to say this is Steve Dillon's final work before he passed away. He did um, these issues here. He did two issues of Wanda. And James Robinson just takes this obscure character that, you know, some writers have, have written off as crazy or just don't know what to do with, so they make her a villain. And he really gives her this shining moments. There are some awesome freaking stories in here. Uh, there's a story, you know, talking about... I mean, they, they he does everything. They talk about her relationship with... Uh, Simon, which is Wonder Man, and if you don't know, even if you don't know much about Wanda, Robinson does an amazing job of reintroducing those elements of her past to new readers. So you find out about her relationship with uh, Simon, Wonder Man, and then Vision, and her children, the Master Pandemonium, Mephisto, all of that is in here. Uh, the variants are sometimes on the opposite page of the regular covers. All the regular covers were supplied by David Aha, and as a matter of fact, they use this uh, for the main cover. So I know I've seen solicitations where uh, it's it's another cover that they use. This is gorgeous artwork. Uh, Joelle Jones supplies some of the artwork in here. So, I mean, you have some freaking awesome artists. Marco Rudy, uh, Vanessa Del Rey, like I mentioned, uh, Joelle Jones and Steve Dillon, Javier Pulido, um, Annie Wu. Just to name a few of the artists that are found in this awesome collection. Now, while some people may say, like, oh, that's really distracting from the story, it isn't, because she's going from one location to another. So, the styles fit. This is such a great issue. So, this is where she talks about all the things that have happened. She does talk about Avengers Disassembled, House of M, if you're worried about that. Look at this. I think this is Joelle Jones, if I'm not mistaken. There's a reunion. This is during, like, a, they, they even threw in a Civil War II tie-in. So, it's a reunion with her brother, Pietro. And then in the very back, this is where they collect, because I'm not going to show how all this ends and how it wraps up. Uh, in the very back is the Doctor Strange story, which introduces a new character. Now, let's see. Nope, there's no extras. All the extras are in between. This is a beautiful collection. This is one of my most wanted oversized hardcovers that I wish they had done, because uh, the artwork is just freaking stellar. Look at that Tom Rainey variant right there. And yes, Javier Pulido. This guy's art. Oh, man. I would have loved to have seen this in oversized hardcover. And who knows? Maybe one day. You know, one division could blow up and everybody could be talking about how great it is. And she'll get her own series. And then we can start getting some Scarlet Witch in oversized hardcover format. Uh, the book is 344 pages and retails for $34.99. Now, let's keep going. Okay, it's that part of the show where I remind you to smash that like button and pause it here or mute me, whatever you do to check out the spines, but here's what all the spines look like together. Morbius, Preludes, and Nightmares. So this is a pretty interesting collection because in this month, we're also getting the Morbius Epic Collection Volume 1. And people have asked me, you know, what's the difference? Why would they do something like this? And I'll explain that. So while the Epic Collection collects everything in chronological order, it's literally half of the uh, omnibus, the first omnibus, this collection mainly focuses on the bigger story arcs with Morbius. It's not very long at all. As a matter of fact, this book is $15.99. And like I said, it's not very long. It's only 144 pages, but collects what is probably the most important parts of Morbius's life, as far as condensing it to 144 pages. So he collects Amazing Spider-Man 101 and 102, uh, the Marvel team of three and four, Fear uh, number 20, and then Amazing Spider-Man number 699.1. I found that interesting to throw that in there because we don't have a collection of anything from Morbius in the 90s, and that's the stuff that I loved reading. While I appreciated uh, the early stuff here, this is the first time he appeared with, um, in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man, and then eventually that led into the team-up, but... While I appreciated that stuff, 
I really enjoyed the night. Actually, all the nineties. Um, you know, you had Ghost Rider. You had uh, you had the new uh, Sun, Rise of the Midnight Sun storyline. The Night Stalkers. Uh, you had Morbius, Darkhold. All those stories I really enjoyed. Because part of me has always loved horror movies, so that's what it felt like. Um, so none of that is in here. We literally go from yeah those uh, appearances. We go into the fear issue. And this is a really good issue, especially the ending of this issue. Holy crap! Uh, I <laughs> I just read that in the um, in the Morbius uh, omnibus, and then this issue right back here, six ninety nine point one, which is the return of Morbius, reintroducing him to Spider Man, and this is written by Joe Keating and Dan Slott. So I find it interesting that we went from the very beginning up until the Dan Slott run of Spider-Man. There's a quite a variety. You have Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway, and like I said, Joe Keating and Dan Slott. But that's pretty much what's collected in here. And this is a trial uh, trade paperback, like something you would hand a, f uh, a friend, like instead of giving them an epic collection, this is something that they, and they've done this quite a lot. They did it for the Eternals. Uh, they've done it pretty much any time a movie has come out, not just Marvel, but also DC has released books like this, uh, thin books like this, like a trial trade paperback, if you will. Avengers by Jonathan Hickman, Complete Collection, Volume 3. The book that so many of you reached out to me about. Last year, you were worried that this was going to be canceled. You didn't see it in the catalog. It kept getting pushed and pushed. It is finally here. So, to answer everyone's concerning questions about Infinity, it is collected all in here completely. So, no worries about that. Um, collecting new Avengers 8 through 12, Avengers 18 through... Holy crap, look at all that cast. No wonder people were so confused reading his run, including myself. <laughs> I had to read it twice. Did it for old reader, new reader, and I understood it a lot more. Um, where was I? Oh, okay. Uh, Avengers 18 through 23, and then Infinity, all six issues of the miniseries. So you have Jonathan Hickman writing all of this. Uh, you have the wonderful talents of artists like Jimmy Chung, uh, Mike Deodato Jr., Lionel Francis Yu, Dustin Weaver, and Jerome Opeña doing the artwork. And to answer most people's question about how the mapping is, this is mapped exactly like the omnibus. So if you're not familiar with Jonathan Hickman's way of mapping, um, it's literally the way that he likes his books to be collected. He likes no covers. And he wants the chapters broken in. So sometimes you'll see a chapter from Infinity in between pages of New Avengers and Avengers. And he himself helps <laughs> map these books. And I think that's really awesome. Uh, because I think for events like this, for for huge epic storylines like Hickman's Hickvengers, particularly because he wrote them, they, uh, they need to be mapped like this. Because he, the writer should know when to read a certain issue. So I love that he is that involved. Not a lot. I can honestly, I can't think of any other writer that does that. Yeah, you know, he's been doing that since his Fantastic Four. Um, but so there are no covers. The chapters are just broken up by this right here. You have white pages, and it's just that that is very stereotypical of Jonathan Hickman. Just a white blank page with font on it and a little symbol. The symbol means so much. But this is the big infinity storyline. Now the big question that I've been getting is Will they collect Secret Wars in the Hickvengers Complete Collections of Avengers? Um, that's kind of redundant. The Jonathan Hickman Complete Collections of Avengers. I don't know. Because Secret Wars felt like the ending to not his Avengers run, but everything that he'd been working up to. Uh, his S.H.I.E.L.D., his Fantastic Four, his Ultimates, his Secret Warriors, and then of course Avengers. That's what it felt like. Not just an ending to Avengers, but they may. I don't know. But rest assured that Infinity is all collected in here. Uh, the book retails for $44.99. It has 512 pages. It is a thick... Oh, this is one of my favorite freaking moments. Uh, Jeromo Pena delivering the artwork. Uh, there, Yeah, there's some beautiful artwork in here. And yes, those Omnis are out of print. I don't know when they will be back into print before people start asking. Um, I, don't, I haven't heard anything about them. So, this is a great way to catch up on Hickman's run on Avengers. Let's look in the back here because I'm going to show you what they do with all the covers. Alright, so all the way in the back, after the story's over, here's the cover gallery. 
So you have infinity number one, two, three, four, and five. Then you have the covers to New Avengers. And this is really cool because then you have the variants back here. Actually, I thought that was a variant. I was mistaken. And then you have the Avengers covers, the free comic book day, and then we kick off the... <laughs> what? I don't remember that one. And then we kick off the variant covers. And they all get their own splash page. Beautiful Arthur Adams artwork. So you get people in here like Humberto Ramos, Ron Lim, Arthur Adams. There's some Ryan Stegman in there. Sarah Pakelli. And then, of course, the Scotty Young stuff. I've always loved that cover. Yeah, there's a lot. Did he do? Yeah, I guess he did one for every issue. Yes, and then the designs, they're all back here. So 512 pages. Here's all the covers connected by Ian Hugh Lee. And $44.99. Now, won't show everything, but let's go on to the next book. All right, next up we have Spider-Man, Craven's Last Hunt. And this is part of the Marvel Select line. And the Marvel Select line, of course, being... Uh, the dimensions of a trade paperback, just ignore the board, uh, because the paper size is identical to the trades. So the Marvel Select line are stories chosen by the editors to that best represent the character. So each character will have one story arc that will be collected in a Marvel Select edition. So much like, I was just showing you the, the size differences, uh, so much like the case with that uh, Morbius book, this is a nicer way to, uh, to gift somebody the best Spider-Man story, according to the editors, and the best representation is Spider-Man, Craven's Last Hunt. This, if, if you've not read this, it is, holy crap, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, there's a deluxe edition of this, there's trade paperbacks of this, there's a standard size hardcover of this, uh, there's the epic collection of this. So, it's an amazing story that you know, really tests the limitations of the character of Spider-Man. I find it interesting that they went with this, uh, well, no, I can't spoil that, but, um, yeah, th this is the story that they decided to go with, and this did just come out, well, I guess not just come out, it was a couple of years, but it's been released, like I said, in the story, um, or the epic collection, Craven's Last Hunt, and if you're not familiar with the story, it's literally the story of Craven's final fight with Spider-Man. He takes down Spider-Man, buries him alive, and then takes over the role of Spider-Man. I will let you find out what happens here. This is all J.M. DeMatteis and Mike Zek doing the artwork. That's so... The artwork is so damn good. I love this storyline. Uh, let's see if there's anything extra. I'm sure there is in the back. Okay, so in the back are the cover pencils. This is insane. All of it is collected here in the splash pages. To own these cup man, to own some of this artwork would be so freaking cool. Interior pencils here. Mike Zek, that dude is an amazing artist. He's the uh, gentleman that did uh, Secret Wars, had a cool, great run on Captain America. And basically, it looks like it's here's thumbnails of his pencils. It's mainly his pencils collected. Uh, this is Fearful Symmetry, which is the collection of Craven's Last Hunt. The deluxe edition cover so this book here retails for $24.99 and has 168 pages and for those wondering about the binding believe it or not it's sewn binding so the splash pages or spread pages open up really nice so it's a nice little book sweet Christmas my man Luke Cage getting his first epic collection one of the things that broke my heart when I sold off my uh, my Marvel Masterworks many years ago. A lot of you all know this story. Uh, by the way, this one is Luke Cage Retribution. This is volume one. This is where everything begins. But as I was saying, one of the things that broke my heart was I literally had just bought Luke Cage Masterwork volume one. And I finally got to read it because I hadn't read so many of these early stories. Like I didn't get into Luke Cage until it was literally Power Man and Iron Fist. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Uh, so it was nice to go back and read those. I think it was the first 16 issues or something like that. And then my foolish self decided to just sell them. And, you know, I, re I regret some of them. But hey, hey, we got the Luke Cage Epic Collection Volume 1. It collects more than that first masterwork. 
Uh, this book retails for $39.99 and has 480 pages. And this is where everything begins. This is where you get to meet uh, the character of Lucas Cage. And he's in a prison and through a series of experiments to get him early parole, he becomes the man known as Power Man. We're introduced to his arch nemesis that has ties to his past, with Willis, I think, uh, Diamondback, and then you get Cottonmouth. And it's it's a really cool introduction to this era of Marvel um, that you know was new to everybody because he is the very first African American character to get his own ongoing series. And here he is, my man. You know, one thing that's interesting, and I think I remember this from the Masterworks, is that for some reason, the very just a couple of pages, it looked like um, it had been faded out the colors. Well, the cover here is vibrant. But yeah, it looks like it's been just faded out, like it's been sitting out in the sun. And it's not, it's just a couple of pages. Um, here's another example. But here he is, Luke Cage. And all his glory, created by Archie Goodwin and George Tuska. So here you get to see his early fights. Yes, this is the classics. I think that meme went around for a decade, over a decade now. And that is the... Where's my money, honey meme? And let me show you where that's from. That's I think it's from issue nine. It's the doctor. It's when he Doctor Doom hires him to do something, and then he doesn't pay him. And literally, Luke Cage snaps, steals the Fantastic Four card. Yeah, right here. And actually, something interesting happens that I didn't know about back here in issue eight. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But yes, yeah, right here. So he goes and tries to get. It's only like two hundred dollars, I think, is what Doctor Doom owes him. And right there, here's that popular uh, meme. When my man reported a crazy black man in the Fantastic Four craft, I knew it had to be you. Where's my money, honey? That's the one that I'm sure everybody has seen on the internet, but this is where it comes from. He literally goes to Doctor Doom to claim his money. Because it's the right thing to do. Because that's the kind of character he is. So he goes and beats the crap out of Doctor Doom. Um, <laughs> and then, yes, we get the Señor Muerte, that guy. So there's a lot of black exploitation in here. And if you're not familiar with that term... Um, there's plenty of documentaries about it. But, you know, to me, I thought it was great. I love this character uh, of Luke Cage. I love how he just treated everybody. He was a good guy. He was a different type of hero. And then he's fighting characters, you know, like Cottonmouth and Diamondback, Señor Muerte. And then he goes and beats the crap out of Doctor Doom because he owes him 200 bucks. I thought that was really awesome. Uh, eventually, Steve Englehart took over the book. Tony Isabella took over the book. And that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, the book is $39.99. It has the years 1972 to 1975 and has 480 pages. And the thing I wanted to talk about was all the way in the back. I didn't know about this. They had changed, according to Steve Englehart, some of the dialogue because he. it was a, what is it? It was Yiddish dialogue. He said that was not politically correct and when it was reprinted they had changed it and i really don't remember what the original dialogue was because i think that by the time the masterworks came out it had been changed but that's in issue number eight and that's the only part of the dialogue that had been changed so as i was saying i wasn't really familiar with this era of luke cage so i'm so glad that they're releasing them in epic formats because this collects hero for hire one through 16 that's what the title was called and then power man 17 through 23 now it stayed power man the title until about issue number what was it, 50 i think is when it changed to power man and iron fist they had canceled iron fist and combined iron fist with power man in one uh comic and it worked because that stayed around for 125 issues so that's the era i'm more familiar with so going back i hope they keep collecting these because i haven't read anything past issue 16 but i did decide to look in the back let's actually let's let me show you some of the stuff in the back here so you have marvel bullpen you have an unused cover sketch right here uh by billy graham who supplied a lot of the inks and then eventually uh drew the book here's some original art all of this by george tusca and billy graham Here's a house ad, a calendar from 1975, and then more original art, the original cover art, love that stuff, and then what I was talking about, um, and then, of course, where else you can get epic collections. 
Marvel Masterworks Spider-Woman Volume 2. That is a very iconic cover because something iconic happens within the issue, which I'm probably sure you can guess what it is. Uh, here are all the covers collected in here, besides, of course, the one in the front. So this collects issues 9 through 25 of Spider-Woman. And the Masterworks, of course, come with this gorgeous leather look to um, Under the Dust Jacket just like all the other Marvel Masterworks. Um, now I've called these the top tier. This is this is the cream of the crop uh, for collected editions because they are. There's so much restoration and love that goes into these. So we as omnibus collectors get excited. Let, but let's, here, let me do, talk about this really quick. So here are the credits. All of this written by Mark Grunewald up until issue, I think 21, yeah. Then Michael Fleischer takes over, takes over the book, Stephen Grant. Carmine Infantino draws most of the um, book in here. Then you have Frank Springer, and then here is your table of contents, which all of this belongs, and where it starts, and then here is the beautiful introduction by Steve Grant, and man, I keep going back and forth, losing my train of thought, I love reading introductions, I think you all know by now how much all the Conan introductions mean to me, even though I haven't read a single issue of that stuff before reading the introduction, I have to read that Roy Thomas introduction, and it just puts you in a place of mind where these writers were at the time, where these creators were, and sure enough, yeah, you get a look inside of Mark Grunewald's head, Mark Grunewald, of course, passed away way too early, 1996, I think is when he passed away, left us way too young, so it's up to these people to re remember those days. And Stephen Grant does this beautiful introduction talking about his friend, Mark Grunewald, and how Mark Grunewald remembered things. And he starts talking about, maybe my memory doesn't serve me right. Maybe maybe I'm just remembering this the way Mark Grunewald would have remembered it. And I thought that ended it beautifully. Um, the, the, the last sentence of his introduction really made me tear up. Because I do miss... Uh, Mark Grunewald. He, he, he wrote some of the best Captain America, Squadron Supreme. But anyway, um, this is his Spider-Woman. We're introduced to characters like uh, the Needle in here. And for the first time, we, are see, we see the meetup of Spider-Man and Spider-Woman. Two characters that have been around for a long time. I mean, she'd been around for 20 issues before meeting him. And Mark Grunewald's last storyline with Frank Springer, because Carmine Infantino had left by now, gets to tell the story of how these two characters meet up, and whether they have a connection or not. But if you've not read it, it's up to you. Then by issue 21, Michael Fleischer takes over the book, Frank Springer still supplying the artwork, and it kind of becomes its own thing. Now, <laughs> what I was going to say is, in that introduction, it, it's really cool to get a behind-the-scenes look, because... Stephen Grant talks about how Mark Grunewald introduced these characters without any backgrounds, all these villains, because he himself, that's Steve Layola, who's still alive, by the way, that was a correction. Uh, somebody, I had a really rough week that week, so I mistook Steve Layola for another artist that had just recently passed away. So what I was going to say is that we get this behind the scene looking at how these characters are introduced without any backgrounds because Stephen Grant talks about how Mark Grumal just knew the stories of these characters and was sure of himself he was going to tell them one day. If he ever needed a story to tell, if he was running short on ideas, he was going to tell the background story of characters like The Needle or Madame Doll. He was eventually going to tell those stories. There's a team up here with the Shroud. But let's look in the back here for some extras. Uh, the, the retail of this book is $75 and it has... 321 pages okay so here's the unused cover to number 13 with the shroud by Carmine Infantino and this is pretty interesting never let the black cat cross your path so Marf Wolfman had first uh, thought of the idea of introducing the black cat in the pages of Spider-Woman before he left the book before Mark Grunewald took over the book so this is pretty cool uh, up here it talks about that how the black cat was first going to be introduced in this volume she was going to be a Film noir inspired femme fatale uh, with the hat and bad luck powers. And here is the original art to issue number nine house ads. And what they always do back here, yes, these wonderful biographies of all these writers and artists. And 
sometimes I hate reading these because, you know, you, you start looking and it seems like so many are gone now. Uh, the Marvel Masterworks, Golden Age, Atlas Age, and the Marvel Age, and then also available. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online source for collected editions up to 50% off retail price. Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on excellent packaging, so your stuff gets to you in excellent condition, and they have amazing customer service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And for all you mentees that are watching, if you're a first-time customer, don't forget to mention that Near Me Condition sent you their way for a promotional credit on free shipping on your next order. Now, this is only for U.S. customers. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your source for the hottest books with deep discounts, customer service, and excellent shipping that will keep you coming back for more. That was the content and the page count of each of these collections. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. If you're only getting hardcovers, if you're still getting the Marvel Masterworks line, if you're getting all the epic collections, are you excited about the new line of Luke Cage epic collections? If you knew who Figment was, was I the only one that didn't know and got him mistaken for Lockheed? Regardless, thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to hit that like button, ring that bell for notifications to let you know when our videos are going live. And speaking of live, don't forget to tune in tonight for Old Reader, New Reader, as Maddie has taken that show over, and I couldn't have left it in better hands. Again, this was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. More importantly, please, everybody, stay healthy, stay safe, and much love to all of you.